So let me do a little recap first as people file in and sit down and stuff. Um, regular season was good. Uh, I think you have to say that. Most points in franchise history, not the most points per game, but the most points overall. Uh, most goals in a season in franchise history. Again, not most goals per game, but most goals. That's not a bad thing. Most wins. Uh, so those are all really positive things. Um, I think the difficulty or the challenges come where uh, we didn't get out of our Champions League group first and foremost. Um, that, and that was a disappointment. Uh, we felt like we were the best team in that group uh, and that we should have advanced, uh, but we weren't able to. So, and and we, uh, we weren't able to score a goal when it counted. So, so uh, we're choosing to look at that as an opportunity. Uh, we felt like uh, each of the last three or four years, uh, there was a really strong, concrete reason to keep the group together. Uh, and honestly, if we had a quarterfinal to play on March 2nd, we probably would have tried to do something along those lines again. Uh, so we're trying to take this now as an opportunity uh, to kind of start, uh, not from the beginning by any means, but uh, start something closer to 2008, 2009, where uh, we try to set up another two or three, four year run. So that's, that's Champions League. Uh, regular season, uh, I think if you would have played in the playoffs against Seattle 100 times, I think we would have split up 50-50. Uh, and I think a year ago, we beat them by a goal. This year, they beat us by a goal. Uh, both really good series. I think, you know, teams like L.A. and Seattle, with the spending advantage they have, you know, those guys are going to be there every year. And I wouldn't be surprised that we play Seattle every single year in the playoffs. Uh, they're never going to be a bad team. Hopefully, we can uh, be as consistently competitive as they are uh, and, uh, you know, have the kind of long-term success that, that we've had. So, um, you know... At the end of the day, we had the same group since basically since 2008, certainly since 2009. Uh, the league tells us that uh, you're not supposed to be able to keep a team for more than three years. The system is designed to pull teams apart over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the reason that's done is, is not because it's not a negative thing. It's that's part of the core philosophy of parity. You know, we don't want to be the EPL where uh, you have four or five teams and, and maybe, maybe at most there's six teams competing for Champions League bursts. And if you make Champions League, you make 25% uh, you know, more money than everybody else does, ensuring a non-competitive season for the following year once again. So there's, trust me, there's a ton of good things about the EPL, their, their television contract first and foremost among them. Uh, but uh, you know, we really feel like in our league, uh, you know, we're, we're in America and American sports with the possible exception of baseball, uh, are about parity. And even base, you know, baseball, now that they've got two wild cards put in, I think you could even say that it's true in baseball too. It's just, it's, it's, it's about fairness. It's what American sports fans expect. Uh, and at the beginning day of almost any season in MLS, everybody's got a chance. You may not have as good a chance as some others, but you got a chance. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a core principle and, and, and that's the foundation of why over time, if you keep the same players and the salary cap goes up 5% and your contracts go up 10 to 15%, it's a math problem. And, and, and you, wind up, you wind up at some point with, a, with an awful big snowball having piled up over four years. Uh, and uh, you know, that's where we found ourselves. We knew we had to cut payroll by about 25%. Uh, and so we said, okay, let's, let's embrace this. There, there is no way forward with the current group. Um, we hadn't won a major trophy in, in three years. Um, we needed to make some changes. And, and again, I, I need to stress that too. We had a good season, but we're here to win trophies. No, nobody's, you guys hear me talk about how LA, Seattle have four and five to one spending advantages over us, and that's true. But that doesn't mean that we lower our expectations or our standards. Our, our goal here is to win trophies. It's to win championships. And that's, that's why we're all here. It's not, we, had, we had a nice regular season, and that's great. But we need to continue to grow and we need to continue to win big games. And so the theme that informed our competitive side was, okay, the salary cap's gonna dictate certain things. We gotta move one or two guys. But the competitive side of not winning the trophy in three years has to dictate some other stuff too. So we chose to, to cut a little bit deeper uh, to go ahead and go all the way to clearing seven figures worth of cap space all in. All those guys we traded away, we got allocation money back, which was added to our cap for next year. Um, and let's try to set up a long-term run again. So he here's the one trend that we identified that we got to fix. 2008, conference final, at home, sellout crowd. We can't score, we go out one nothing in New York. Uh, 2009, we win. 2010, we score, when we score one goal against Columbus, we only had one home game. 2010, uh, we come back, all we need is a, is a one goal win against Dallas. We do score a goal, but we only manage a tie, we go out. And you'll see in the sequence of events, it's actually the only game we score a goal in. 
2011, Champions League final, Monterey. All you need is a draw to go through. Can't get a goal, you go out 1-0. Uh, 2012 then, Herediano. All you need is a goal to go through. Don't get it, you go out. Uh, playoffs, Seattle. All you need is one goal. Don't get it, you go out. So in five games, the five biggest games in the history of this building, we've scored one goal. And the, we have to fix that. We have to try to go out and bring more guys into the team that can score goals. Um, defense is always going to be a foundation of this club. The team will remain the star. Nobody's talking about going out and buying, you know, name whatever $30 million forward you can think of. But it's the idea that collectively we have to bring more players into positions so that big time players can score the biggest goals on the biggest stage. Uh, you know, the flaw in Moneyball, if you look at the, the Oakland A's, guys, how many, how many people have seen that movie, Moneyball? All right, a couple. The flaw in Moneyball is that if you get all value players, all players that overachieve or overperform against certain metrics, you're probably not going to wind up with any special players. And if you're going to win the biggest games, especially in a sport like soccer where it's very difficult to score, you have to have special players. You have, it doesn't, and again, that doesn't mean high-priced stars, but it means guys who are willing to take the responsibility to step up in the biggest moments at the biggest times and say, I'm going to score. The team's not going to score. I am. Uh, and we need to adjust our mentality. We need to bring in players that, that are willing to take that responsibility because uh, that's the only way we're going to change this pattern of always being pretty good but never being great because our goal has got to be great. And to be clear, there's some risk in this. Our risk is when you change as much as we've changed, <clears throat> you may take a half step back before you move two steps forward. So that is, that's the blueprint, that's the plan, that's what we believe. Uh, and it may take some time. There's the, number, the sheer number of players we're gonna change is gonna cause some kind of adjustment or transition period. So we ask all of you for your continued support. Uh, we would not be here without you. Uh, we would not have the resources to invest in our team that we do had we not uh, had the attendance that we had this year. Um, uh, as you guys might have heard, uh, we got up to over 8,000 season tickets this past year. We're hoping for 10,000 tickets uh, the next year. Uh, and, you know, look, I personally am optimistic we can, we can exceed 10,000. And, and the, the significance of that is that if you can get blow past 10,000 up toward 12,000 or so, most of the modeling we do shows that then you're going to sell out every single game. And once you sell it every single game, now you're maximizing your revenue. Now you're maximizing your revenue, which means you can spend more money. On, now you can maximize our ability as a team to go out and find the best players, find the best coaches, devote, devote the most resources to the team's success. So for us, the, the lifeblood of the team specifically, our business, we all got to raise revenue. We got to sell sponsorship. We got to sell tickets. Everybody likes season tickets. For the team, season tickets are the single most important thing that there is. Be not, and and it's certainly it's revenue, but it's revenue that's up front. So you have money in your pocket at the end of the year that you know you can go out. I can go on this scouting trip. I know I can go look at these three guys because I got this money here that I can go spend. There's that. There's also, when you play these games in March, where our home opener is likely to be March 9th, and it's cold and it's snowing and it's not that much fun to be out here, it's you guys that get our players ready to play. It's you guys that have sold out the last couple of home openers and that, you know, when our guys walk out for warm-ups, they hear you, they feel the presence of our crowds. Uh, and I just want to say, say thank you again to all of you uh, and stress again how important, how critical you've been to our success. As we've made this run as a team, our crowds have increased. We had 4,000 season tickets when we used to open this building. We're now over eight. As I said, I expect us to be over 10 in a year. I'm hoping we can get to 12. So look at that progression in the crowd. Look at the progression in the team. They're parallel. There's a reason for that. So please, please uh, keep coming out, even when it's, even when it's snowing out. Because uh, if you look at the games we sold out, basically every game from July on we sold out. I think there might be one exception. So the games that we don't sell out right now are March, April, May in particular and, and part of June. So if you can talk your friends into coming and getting off their skis for some time in the spring next year, uh, I think we're going to have a pretty exciting new team. Uh, we're certainly going to have some new faces that will be worth watching. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And, and uh, I'll open up the floor to questions at this point, and uh, I'm sure there'll be many. I know you're going to pick up the striker. It's obvious. Uh, RSL style is not really kind of the American or European style. It's more kind of Latin. Are you looking south of the border for your striker? Yes. Uh, we are, we are, we've been in uh, 
Central and South America scouting already in this off season. Uh, we are, uh, some of this is just economics. Uh, the economies are, are less well developed in lots of parts of Central and South America, and so the players are more affordable. Um, Brazil, for the most part, is still a market that's out of our reach, but everything else pretty, is now pretty much coming into our reach as our league go, grows. Uh, so, yes, we're, we're going to look for those types of players. I mean, look, we have Saborio, a guy that scored more than 50 goals the last three years. What we need is a compliment to him. We don't need to redo our team. We need a guy who can succeed by playing a positions off of Sabo that can maximize their goal scoring potential and score consistently. And you're not, I know you're not going to be surprised to hear this, but the solution is not going out and getting one big star forward to play next to Sabo. It's getting two or three guys that can play and can rotate and can compete for spots and maintain our core philosophy of the team as a star. So if Sabo comes back from Costa Rican duty and, and his knee's hurting him and he needs a rest, we actually have an option to sit him down because at the end of the year, then maybe he's got a little bit more left in the tank. And it's not to say he didn't at this year, just when we asked Sabo to play, I think he played more than 40 games this year. He's 30 years old next year, might even be turning 31. You know, we need to be mindful of that as well and maximize his career, not just winning on Saturday. Um, what are you guys thinking about what logo are you going to change you said Zango? Uh, we are going to have Zango back as our jersey sponsor again next year. There's one year left on that contract. Um, we have had conversations exploring uh, potential other sponsors going forward, but certainly Zango would be included in those conversations uh, you know, going forward. But to be clear, that's, that would impact the 2014 season. 2013, it will be Zango as the jersey front sponsor again. As you know, gold scores don't just fall from the sky, unfortunately. I wish. A lot more guys could do my job if they did, though. With the seven figures you have available, how easy or hard do you think that job is? You... Two things. One, one clarification. We, we, we affected a seven-figure flip on our cap, but if you remember, we started 25% over. So we, we do not have seven figures available. Just that was the, the room we were able to, to take in between losing the salaries of, in particular, Will Johnson, Hamas Nalave, Fabian Espindola, uh, and the allocation money we added. So first point, uh, minor point. Um, Randy, your, your question, are, are you, our process is always the same, so in terms of how we find these guys. You know, we have Andy Williams, we brought aboard a year ago as a full-time scout, uh, and Andy is going to earn his paycheck in the offseason. He already is. Uh, so he identifies a mass of people. We go out and, and work with the clubs and the agents, and we decide which of those players we can afford. We then send people out to watch them live, scout them. Um, we have a, a product called Y Scout now that we added a year ago as well. Basically, you can watch any soccer game from anywhere in the world at any time on this product. It's amazing. So we can watch now, as opposed to even three years ago, our process was of soliciting DVDs from clubs and agents, and they'd send us things in the mail, and we'd open them up and stick them in our hard drive and watch them. And you could get one or two games. Y Scout has 10 games on any player on the planet. You, pop, you can log online, and you can pop them up, and away you go. It's all about just, just about hard work. Uh, so we have a lot of guys watching the video, we get a lot of targets, and I think, Randy, the strategy for us is going to be to identify, this is where we are now, at least half a dozen guys that we feel are absolutely top class, and now negotiate as hard as you can to try to figure out which ones will shake free. The, the immediate challenge for us is that the Mexican season has just ended, Mexico pays more than we do. So uh, you probably are in, wouldn't call it a holding pattern between now and Christmas, but you have more credibility after Christmas with South American and Central American teams because no matter what you offer them right now, they're, they're probably going to sit there and say, hey, but you know what, but Mexico might offer more than you do. So it's, it's, you can, if, you're, if you're not smart, you can actually bid up your own price because you can, you can put in an offer that's, if it's aggressive. Now they, they're going to wait anyway, and then they're just going to ask for a little bit more money you know, whenever the Mexican window closes. So, you know, for the truly high-profile guys, the Europe, you know, European window opens in January. But to be honest with you, we're probably not in the market to be able to afford the guys that are going to Europe anyway. So it really is a competition with Mexico. And over the next two to three weeks in particular, I don't think there's going to be a ton of movement. The earliest date we're allowed to sign guys is January 20. I, I'm not sure that exact date, but somewhere right around there. Uh, that's when our transfer window opens. So it's open January 20 to April 20. Uh, and during that period, we can sign players. Now, we can, we can sign guys to contracts before then, but the contracts become effective the day the transfer window opens. And uh, if that's able to happen, then our, our preseason opens right around there. I think it's January 18, our, our preseason opens. So uh, we still have a scenario, Randy, where we could ha even have two forwards, two new forwards in by opening day of preseason. Now, that's the most optimistic scenario. Uh, I wouldn't say that we would panic if that's not the case. Um, you know, 
but I said this before um, with respect to the other way we can get forwards is, as a, uh, in addition to signing them abroad is to, to trade for them. Uh, and I think that that's a little bit trickier scenario because you're almost certainly going to have to give away something of pretty good value to get you know, a meaningful starting level striker. And on top of what's likely to be a high salary, that package is probably going to be more expensive than what you can get a guy for from abroad. So that's, that's kind of the way, the way we'd weigh it. Uh, with Will Johnson exiting, um, there's a big gap in the midfield. Is the thinking to bring in maybe somebody who could play 25 or 30 games or to promote from within, say, a Louis Scale or Sebastian Velasquez or David Beyond? Yeah, the, the answer is we're looking at all our choices right now. Uh, our, our top priorities are forwards right now. Uh, but if we have enough resources left after signing forwards, could we add a midfielder? Absolutely. Um, I would tell you that if, if you know, <coughs> uh, we hope to have an answer with Javi Morales. We're in negotiations with him. I think we're going to have an answer by next week, one way or the other. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but uh, if, if he were to come back, uh, then you have Javier, Kyle, Ned, pretty, pretty three lockdown veterans, and you got Luis Gill, who you know, we think the sky's the limit for. So that's as good, in my opinion, as good a starting group of midfielders as you're going to find. And now if you, do, if you dabble in not just Sebastian Velasquez, but uh, um, David Viana, Enzo Martinez. And again, I know you guys haven't seen a lot of Enzo, but he's a player we remain high on. Uh, we think your Donny Alvarez with another year in the system potentially could play the side of Diamond, not just in that holding role. Uh, and I'll tell you what, this kid Cole Grossman we picked up, uh, and not just because he's from Duke, we're pretty high on him. <coughs> um, <laughs> For those who don't know, me and Jason both went at Duke, so we, we, get, we, get, we get razzed for that a little bit. But uh, Cole, uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, before we, we had the waiver draft, uh, the, the GM from Columbus and I were speaking, and you know, he really said a lot of positive things. I thought, oh, you know, that's great. He's, he's, he's being polite and he's being nice, but he, you know, he recommended Cole. Um, but as we, were, as we selected Cole, so you know, we made our own evaluation. We, we picked Cole in the waiver draft a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> and uh, as we're all, we, the, way we, the way these things work is you do a conference call. You call into a number and, and then, you know, literally one team's on the clock and then the second team and blah, blah, blah. So we pick Cole Grossman and in the background of the call we hear, uh, I'm not going to repeat the word, but <clears throat> uh, a, a colorful profanity coming from the uh, line uh, on the uh, thing. So clearly they were a team that, that felt that uh, Cole Grossman could have benefited their team. And then within 20 minutes we had a team call to say, what do you want for Cole? Uh, and then I was down in the, in the, we were doing an Adidas My Coach thing down in, uh, in Phoenix a couple days ago, and Mike Lapper, the assistant from Columbus, came up to me and, and went out of his way unsolicited to tell me how high they were on Cole Grossman as well. So it seems like a personality conflict a little bit with the head coach there. Everybody else in that organization is raving about this kid, and we have teams trying to trade for him. You don't hear that that much about a waiver guy usually. So Cole Grossman, you guys haven't seen him. Uh, you guys actually have possibly seen him. Cole's played in this building. Uh, he played the Champions League quarterfinal 2011, uh, and we smashed Columbus on the day. But, uh, uh, you know, he's a, it's a kid again, we think. But so the answer to the question is, here's the thing about young players. You, you don't ever want to be in a world where you're relying on a young player to deliver. Because this is, young players are good, and then they're bad, and they're good, and they're bad. And the hardest thing about being a pro is to be consistent. And, but if you got five, Yana, Velasquez, Martinez, uh, Jordani, Cole Grossman, you got five. If two of those guys succeed, we're pretty darn good. So, you know, and that's not even counting Louis Gill. So, so that's, you know, we feel pretty good about our midfield group, I tell you. The reason we've stayed away from that is that when we've scheduled Saturday afternoon games most often have been for playoff games. And the theory has been same, similar to, I think, where you're going, which is in October, November, it's cold. Let's have these games in the afternoon. And, and, but our attendance has been very poor at those games, literally down like 5,000 a game. So the... Now, part of that might be going in the fall, going head to head with college football, um, but you run into you're more likely to run into youth soccer leagues, things like that, in, in March and April. And I don't pretend to know where every child's and every age group's youth game is off the top of my head, but um, it's something we'll look at. I think it's a good suggestion. But the track record of games played earlier is not good. It's not good at all, actually. So that's that's that would be our hesitation. But obviously, the more comfortable folks are, the more likely they are to to come. So. The question for those who maybe couldn't hear him in the back was, how do trades work? Um, and, uh, you know, and so he, he's, obviously Will has tweeted some nice things about us, said some nice things about us in the press since he left. Um, uh, you know, look, we pride ourselves on being a player's organization. Uh, we are still, after five years of doing this, 
the only team in MLS that's got everybody in our staff, from GM on through down through the, the most junior assistant coach, has played five years or more in MLS. All of us are former players. We, we, we live, eat, and breathe, and watch our games from the perspective of, as, of former players. Um, and to that end, when you trade guys, if you're able to treat them with respect, we feel like there's a real value in that long term. Not just on that trade to that player, but in terms of how your organization is viewed by players around the league. Because if, for us, knowing that we're not going to spend with Seattle, New York, LA, we're not a glamorous destination in that standpoint. We better be a respected one. Uh, and I would tell you that we've, we've done that. We've been successful that way. Players want to play for us, both from the style of play that Jason institutes, but also because we treat our guys with respect. And so with, with Will specifically, uh, we, you know, we knew we were in this cap situation. Will had a, made a good salary. Uh, we worked with him and we said, hey, you know, is, there, is there any chance you take a pay cut? I don't, I've never known a player in my life that wants to take a pay cut, so the answer predictably was no. Uh, and we said, okay, well, we're getting offers for you at such a level that we, we, we have to consider trading you. It's, it's the only common sense approach. Uh, and, he, and he said, okay, I understand. And he's like, well, where are they from? And we gave him the teams. Uh, and he said, do you mind if I talk to them and try to work out what the best situation for me is? And I said, absolutely. If we work together and you tell me which team you really want to go to and that team matches the offers that we have out there, then we're happy to do that. And so, again, Will is, it's... Uh, <clears throat> Will's a sad one for me. He, he's one of my favorite players we've ever had. Um, but we just got offers that were high enough that we, ha that we had to consider them. Uh, and we worked together. It was, it was he and I on the phone and him saying, all right, I've talked to everybody. I want to go here to Portland. Uh, and me calling Portland and saying, if you match, then it's a done deal. Um, and we did it. And it's, you know, for Will with a little baby, um, it was tough. It was tough for him. It's tough to lose him. But... We feel like we did the best we could. How much money do you get annual from TV contract per team? Uh, let me try to do this math. The, the, the answer is that we, there's three TV contracts. There's a Spanish language contract with Univision. There's, there's a contract with ESPN. There's a contract with uh, NBC. So my, my ballpark, and, and I don't know, is Trey, is Trey here? Yeah, right here. Uh, 20 million? Is that, is that the ballpark for all three combined? Or is it less than that? All three. All three con television contracts per year? 20, 20 million, it's, it's a rough number, but that's, that's the, the, those three combined is about 20 million. There's 19 teams. It's, it's a million a year. What's the percentage of that versus ticket sales? What's the percentage of TV money versus ticket TV sales? TV money is an infinitesimal amount of our revenue. It, it, it's, it's an almost meaningless line item. Uh, sponsorship and ticket sales make up, uh, are the two, those are the two pillars upon which our business is built. Uh, and look, the game changer for us is that in 2014, all of the television contracts are up. And then the ver there's various strategies as to how you do it, but you guys have probably watched as sports television rights have really gone up dramatically. And part of that is everybody TiVo's everything right now, right? But the only thing that everybody watches live is their favorite team playing sports on TV, whether that's NASCAR, or football, or basketball, or whatever. You fans will still carve out time to watch that game live because they know otherwise they're going to have to read about it on Twitter or or uh, Facebook or whatever, and, and it annoys them, so they want to watch the game live. So they will then, networks will pay a lot of money to capture those people. And so in 2014, um, I'll, I'll defer to my boss here, Bill Manning, but he thinks we can achieve a five-fold increase in the deal if it's packaged correctly. So now that becomes then a meaningful number, you know, and that potentially allows you then to go out and find a different class of player as well. So a little bit of the challenge strategically with our league is, we know we're not the EPL. For those, those uh, who don't follow every word of Commissioner Garber, um, we're trying, we're striving to become one of the best leagues in the world by 2022. Everybody knows you've got to invest more money to do that. So the question is, can you, what comes first? The television contract, or, so do you go out and sign a bunch of star players so you get a better TV contract, or do you get to be a better TV contract and you use that to go out and sign the star players? And the answer is the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but everybody knows we're going to continue to try to get better and continue to keep putting a, a better and better quality product uh, on the field. And this, it's not just on the top there from spending more money, but it's also youth development. That's the other big, big pillar. <coughs> we're investing a ton of money in that. Um, Carlos Salcedo will join us uh, as of January 1st uh, out of our academy. Uh, Lalo Fernandez is our number three goalkeeper. He's from our academy. Uh, and it's possible we could sign uh, one or two or even three more guys out of our academy uh, at some point during the 2013 uh, calendar year. So, so that's something we really believe in. Would a five-fold increase give you more money than the Mexican clubs? 
No. No. No, but, but uh, you know, it, it's significant. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it, would be, it would be a game, an, an, amount, a mag, an increase of that magnitude would be a game changer in the sense that you would now, most of the teams in the league could be profitable at that point. Right now, still the majority of the teams are not profitable. Certainly not after you pay the mortgage and all this, you know, it's since I think, how many, watch, how many people watch the final? Yeah. LA Houston. All right, one of, one of the, the amazing stats there was when David Beckham was signed, you know, everyone debates this, David Beckham. David Beckham was the single greatest thing that's ever happened in this league. Hands down, no discussion. And the, the numbers that tell you things like that are, uh, aside from the fact that when I was working at the law firm in DC when David was signed and, and uh, none of the women there would speak to me, but when David signed, suddenly I was the most popular <laughs> guy in the law firm because <clears throat> um, everybody wanted to go to the DC United game. Uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of pop culture side of it. But, but if you look in 2007, I, I know I'm going to screw these numbers up, so Trey, jump in one to correct me. But we had six or seven stadiums in 2007. We got 16 now. So, I mean, it's more than double the number of stadiums. So one of the big costs we have right now is we've got to pay for these things. You know, and, and they all cost between $125 and $250 million. So, uh, you know, you're not going to pay for that in a year or two years or three years. So... If you get $5 million more a year, does it make a difference? Absolutely. Because relative to your mortgage, you're probably able to break even for the first time. But as a league, that's, that is a strategic cost that we have to address. And, and, and it's, we're going to spend the next 10 or 15 years paying for it. But it's a good investment. So it's, it's, it's a game changer for our league.